I'm going to quickly introduce our team here. Uh, I'm Satra. I'm one of the PIs of the Dandy project. I'll give an overview of the project in a second, uh, but I will ask the other members of the team to introduce themselves, and then I can go on with the overview. Ben, I'm going to go in order of people I see. All right, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Dichter. I'm the community liaison for Dandy. I'm also um, integrated in the NWB community. And um, I my role is to help people use NWB and Dandy. So I'm happy to uh, present to you today. And also um, I um, would be happy to work with you all individually to help you get integrated into this software. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Dorota? Hi, my name is Dorota Yaretska and I work for MIT um, and I'm in the Satra group. So I'm wor working mostly on uh, then the eye character that I will be presenting today and, um, and other components of the Dendi project. Thank you. Yarek? Hi, I'm Yaroslav Olegovich Halchenko. I'm leading Center for Open Neuroscience at Psychology and Brain Sciences Department of Dartmouth College. And I'm a co-PI uh, on Dendi project. And my purpose to just make your research more efficient one way or another. Thanks, Yarek. Uh, I think Christian has dropped out. Oh, no, he's there. No, no, I haven't. Go for it, Christian. Ah, OK. Um, short introduction? Yes. OK, so uh, my name is Christian. I'm a neuroscientist. I've started using uh, a lot of uh, data sharing uh, standards and platforms back during my PhD. And uh, I've recently joined the project. And I hope that uh, I, can, I can aid in, um, in making it more useful for biologists and contributing a bit of the domain knowledge to the standards. Thanks, Christian. And so what we will do is our agenda for today is quite simple. I'm going to give a little overview of the Dandy project to folks, and then we will get on to uh, a hands-on section uh, going through the different components of Dandy. The intent of today's workshop is really meant to be a user-facing workshop. Uh, so we will have further workshops later on that are focused more on developers, uh, so, uh, kind of people who want to do conversions to NWB or bid standards and how to learn about those things. Uh, for today, our focus is really that Dandy has a bunch of components now, and we need to kind of give people uh, an awareness of what they can do with Dandy, and that's our focus. So I'll get started, I'll share my screen. So DANDY stands for uh, Distributed Archives for Neurophysiology Data Integration. It's an acronym, and, uh, but we're not quite there as a distributed archive yet. In fact, what we think of ourselves right now is an archive and a collaboration space uh, for neurophysiology projects. Uh, so who is DANDY? Uh, it's currently being run out of three institutions, and Catalyst Neuro is a consulting partner for DANDY that Ben leads. Uh, and there are several folks who have been involved with various aspects of Dandy development. Uh, I won't go through everybody's names, but we have a very strong software engineering team at Kitware who helps us. And then folks at Dartmouth and MIT are helping out with overseeing kind of all the different components of Dandy and in some of the engineering uh, efforts that you'll see. Uh, we are supported by the Brain Initiative um, and also by the AWS Public Dataset Program, which is important to us because it allows us to store data uh, openly and publicly and freely uh, on AWS for easy cloud access. We're also thankful to a lot of collaborators, uh, Neurodata Without Borders, uh, the BICCN Consortium, including the Brain Cell Data Center, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, the BIDS community, the Open Scope Project, the INCF, the International Brain Initiative, uh, and uh, Lee Kamensky and the Chung Lab at MIT who have been instrumental in some of the key data sets that we now currently have on Dandy. So as you all know, neuroscience today is multi-scale, multi-species, and people are developing all kinds of theories uh, that includes various models and experimental designs. Uh, 
these are driving various biological applications, which include clinical and behavioral research, but also knowledge generation to understand more about the brain across species. And this requires development of new tools, which could be instruments, which could be protocols, which could be all kinds of processing things uh, that are needed to work with the data being produced by these instruments and protocols. And the data itself uh, is increasing on a daily basis. Uh, it's increasing in scale, it's increasing in its descriptor and complexity, and the provenance of things as we get into a digital domain is also changing on a daily basis as new software, new tools are being used to produce neuroscience data. And for this, we need some kind of infrastructure to help dissemination, search, visualization, and computation on such data. But we wanted this infrastructure not just to be a technical infrastructure, we wanted it to aid collaboration and coordination. Uh, and finally, as uh, the word FAIR gets to be commonplace amongst all kinds of scientists around the world, we wanted it to be uh, FAIR as well as efficient in helping people do research. Many of you are probably familiar with the complexity of today's uh, experimental workflows. Uh, this is one example of the NeuroPixels workflow, which involves everything from surgery to ex vivo imaging and everything in between. Um, and all of this complexity needs to be encoded somehow when you disseminate data. And what we are hoping is that the archive will help people kind of unravel this complexity when they look at search for and gather data for themselves and put it into the archive or search for this in the archive for their own use. Similarly, there is kind of a data explosion going on. So here's an example of just NeuroPixels again, that just a couple of NeuroPixels probes can give rise to a rate of data that's beyond most people's kind of normal storage. You're not gonna be able to put it on Figshare or Zenodo because you're gonna be running out of space to put the raw data in. So this forces a lot of people to create derivatives of data to put out there uh, for sharing, which is great. Something is better than nothing. But as a community, we know that neuroscience hasn't quite reached the stage where we understand all aspects of processing. So it would be really nice if people could post their raw data out there. And this is where Dandy kind of comes in. It's an archive for publishing and sharing neurophysiology data. And this includes electrophysiology, optophysiology, and behavioral time series, as well as storing images from immunostaining experiments. And alongside that, data from associated MR or other modalities. And I'll introduce this concept called the dandy set, which is an organized collection of assets with both file level and data set level metadata generated from an experiment or a project. So in essence, we are looking at Dandy as a collection uh, where each Dandy set itself is a collection of assets that mean something to you as the scientist. So it could be a logical collection of assets that were relevant to a publication, or it could be a collection that involves all the assets produced by an experiment of which a subset might be used for a publication. And we'll go into some of these details a little later on. So let me give an example of a few Dandy sets that are out there. Uh, here's an example of a dandy set that was used to evaluate spike interface, which is a framework for spike sorting. Um, and this dandy set uh, has been around for a while, but was recently published by the authors of the dandy set uh, and you can access it. And as a result of this being online, all of the scripts and tools that were run in the original paper could also be run uh, with the data that's on Dandy set. And you'll see some examples of this as we move forward with our hands on things a little later today. Here's an example of a microscopy data set uh, from MIT that uh, Lee and Casey's group have been running. And this data set, uh, which was when I put the slide up at 14.7 terabytes, it's now over 90 terabytes of data is also available on Dandy. And you can browse through it without having to download 90 terabytes to your hard disks. And this is where some of the cloud components of Dandy really help in getting this scale of data out to many users. 
Then there are data sets like this. Uh, this data set uh, involves four different sites, uh, one at MGH, uh, one at Boston University, one at Lens in Italy, and then at Columbia. And they, were, they are using multiple techniques, uh, one primary technique at each site, and then samples are being shipped around from one site to another. And what Dandy has enabled them to do is have each site upload data into a consistent space for collaboration purposes. So this is an example of a perspective space of data, ongoing data collection, where you can put the data up across collaborative teams that they can work on it, whether in the hub or on their own sites with the data that's put out there. So overall, Dandy is composed of a web application and an API server. We're using standardized descriptors to format data into consistent ways for distribution. Uh, you might be using some other formats locally. We try to insist on common formats for distribution because it makes life easier for any downstream users of the data by other people. And we are leveraging the Neurodata Without Borders format for neurophysiology, the brain imaging data structure or BIDS for various MRI related data, and NIDIUM for various terminological and ontological and provenance related extensions of uh, the data sets in Dandy. Alongside putting data in standardized descriptor form, uh, we have a Jupyter Hub that's running and you'll be playing with this today, uh, which allows you to do various kinds of analytics and visualization on the data. And the archive itself, uh, you can arrange for your data sets to have ownership by other folks, uh, whether it's collaborators at the same institution or different institutions and their Python clients and a tool called Datalad, which can be used to access the information in the archive. And we are leveraging various common data formats um, and providing various levels of user interaction that hopefully you'll get to see today and play with it uh, through the web browser, through the shell and using our API server. And this entire platform is built on open source technologies. Uh, and our intent was to allow for these, for the platform to be accessible and contributable to by different kinds of uh, user personas, uh, all the way from hardware developers to citizen scientists. And we've come a fair bit of ground over the last couple of years that this archive has been active. Uh, we now have the web UI and external web apps. We have the Jupyter Hub, uh, the Metacell and the NWB Explorer. Uh, and data lab to access data. We made some progress in the way of conversion tools and uh, creating the API server that supports this. And there are other things that are not yet done, but we are hoping to get to it uh, over the next couple of years, which includes local kind of graphical clients, as well as processing tools that allow various kinds of things, whether it's conversion, or spike extraction or other kinds of things that the community decides is important for Dandy. And we've done this all based on a set of open source tools, which means anybody can contribute to it. Anybody can reuse these components. And we'll go through some of these uh, pieces of Dandy components uh, in the workshop today. Uh, but the key things to keep in mind is that you can seek help uh, through help at dandyarchive.org and you can ask questions. And I'll paste the link for the questions before the next section starts. What I would love for you to do is I'm hoping that all of you have created your GitHub accounts. Uh, and if something comes up that's a question in your mind, I would love for you to post it on the help desk so that it can be sustained there for anybody else to see. So what data are in Dandy? Uh, the ones that are highlighted in red are the different kinds of data modalities that are currently available on Dandy. Uh, we've grown from about two terabytes of data uh, in, from June 2020 to about 123 terabytes right now. Uh, the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network itself has grown from about 11 gigabytes to about 96 terabytes of data. And this is just a starting point. Uh, all of this is kind of growing at a fairly exponential rate right now that we hope to be able to sustain through our partnerships with various uh, agencies and institutions. Uh, there's multimodal data uh, from intracellular and extracellular recordings, optical data, MRI data, OCT, uh, light sheet microscopy data, and also human ECOG data for at least one of the data sets that's on Dandy. 
Uh, there's longitudinal multi-session data, there's behavioral data involving optogenetic stimulation, free behaving, and other associated data like video recordings. And right now we have over 70 dandy sets containing data, but overall, if you look in the archive, you'll see about 116 today. And the reason for this is we encourage people to create dandy sets where they reflect ongoing data collection where data has not been submitted yet. And we hope that this encourages collaboration across scientists as they come to the archive, they find data sets that they might be interested in and contact the people to be able to get to and add new data or run collaborative experiments together. But there is an ecosystem we are hoping to build around Dandy. Um, and you'll see the hub, which, is, which uses Jupyter Hub, which is an entire community by itself, but also external tools like NWB Explorer, the Bioimage Suite, which help augment some of the facilities that are available in Dandy. And you'll get to play with some of these uh, over the course of today's session. Overall, Dandy is a fair archive. Uh, we are using rich schemas with the use of standard ontologies. Uh, all elements carry unique identifiers. They're searchable on Dandy archive and linked data is exposed. So this makes it findable. Uh, we are using standard file formats, standard protocols, uh, and we are providing various ways to access different, kind, different parts of the archive to enhance accessibility. Through the standardization of metadata and data formats, uh, we are hoping that the archive becomes interoperable, as in you can build tools because we are putting data in standard form. There's NWB out there, and if you build a tool for NWB, anybody who's depositing data in NWB can use that tool. Uh, also, anybody who's downloading data from NWB can expect to see common patterns, or anybody who's downloading data using bids is expecting to see common patterns. And this simplifies communication between labs, or perhaps even within a lab, uh, as grad students and postdocs leave and other people come in, they get to understand pieces of data. And finally, all aspects of Dandy are reusable. We, every data set has a license. Uh, we use a rich metadata schema for neurophysiology data, which allows you to reuse uh, the dandy sets for your experiments. And all the software components are released under free and open source licenses. So where are we headed? Uh, we have a few features that should be immediately available, hopefully by the end of the year or early next year, which is uh, we're implementing an embargo policy using an IHS policy. The search across assets, uh, you'll see search across dandy sets, but we'll be providing even more finer grained search uh, across all the assets because we have the metadata that goes alongside each asset and support for ZAR data sets. So ZAR is a cloud native format uh, for various kinds of scientific uh, computation, which makes life a lot easier when you're putting large amounts of data in the cloud. Uh, we hope to put more applications on Dandy Hub, and this, we need your help. We want to know what you would like to see on the Hub. So hopefully when you get a sense of the kinds of things that you can do on the Hub, you can let us know here are the kinds of tools that would be available for use on the Hub. Uh, we want to provide user annotation of Dandy sets. So people are posting Dandy sets of various kinds. We would love to know how users think about what questions could be asked of, of those dandy sets or what they have been able to do or what they have spotted. Maybe somebody has done better quality control and wants to annotate a dandy set with those quality metrics. We want to be able to enable some of those things. Uh, we want to be able to enable easier building of custom dandy sets. You may be interested in slices of data across multiple dandy sets. Could you put that together easily for, to create a dandy set that you do analysis on? Uh, while this is feasible, it's currently a little more challenging for people to do. Uh, we would want to make that easier. Finally, as the community comes to a consensus around good workflows, good validated workflows, we want to be able to say, as soon as you push the data into the archive, we can run some of these workflows and produce the necessary outputs for downstream use. Could be something like spike sorting or cell detection, uh, which I hope that the community will come to consensus on for some of the elements uh, at least, or even comparative workflows, uh, multiple spike sorting things or cell detection things. Uh, and the word, uh, the D in Dandy does stand for distributed, the first D, and we hope that we can deploy this in your local infrastructure in the future so that you can curate and do all the things that you can do on the hub locally and then push the data to the archive 
uh, for centralized storage and distribution. So in summary, Dandy is a fair archive for neurophysiology data and a collaboration space for you. And we would love uh, for you to use it and tell us how we can help you. Over the next uh, pieces of today's workshop, uh, you're going to see how the web UI works and functions, uh, how the hub, the computation hub uh, can be used for doing things. And that will today be a mixture of both how to upload data to Dandy as well as how to use data on Dandy. And finally, you'll see something uh, about the Dandy common line interface, which allows you to really play with data from your workstation and how you organize and upload data to Dandy. Uh, we are not going to talk about the API schema metadata model today or S3 bucket details today, but happy to answer any questions when we have the open discussion on some of those. And we'll have future developer focused workshops on using the API and building tools around Dandy. And I will end with finally saying that there is a help desk. I'll post the link uh, in the chat window and you can publish Dandy sets and mint DOIs and you'll see a demonstration of that today as, 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 you, as the workshop progresses. Uh, and those DOIs can be included in your grant applications and it becomes a citable quantity as it goes. So I will stop there and hand it over to Dorota. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So once again, uh, my name is Dorota, and today I will be talking about a web uh, interface and how can you use the web interface to interact with the NT archive. So I will have like around 25 minutes and I will have like two short components. The first one will be how to use, uh, how to search for existing data, data dendy sets and how to learn more information about the dendy sets. And the second part will be like creating your own um, dendy set using dendy archive. So um, this will be the first part of like hands-on. So I would like you to follow, try to follow what I'm doing. And I will give like, I will give you some time at the end of the first session to for like short exercise and we have some short pause. So first of all, and if for anyone who has questions, you can interrupt me. So, um, or you can also like write your question to chat and I'm sure that other uh, people from Denti, um, Denti project will be like monitoring the chat. Okay, so, I will start searching, uh, sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. So first of all, like, um, and maybe I will ask someone to also type this to the chat, but you can type then the archive. And, and you will end up in the, uh, in the website that you already seen doing uh, such a presentation. So this is our main, uh, our main, um, our main page. And from the very beginning, you can see that you can have, you can go to public dendy sets. So this is the place where you will see all the public dendy sets that were, were already um, uploaded to dendy archive. And you see from the very beginning that like you have like many, many dendy sets. I think there are like uh, right now around more than hundreds of dendy sets. Um, and from the very like from this uh, from this page, you can see the name of the dendy sets. You can see the identifier. You can see the contact person, and you can also like see how big is the dendy set and how many files you have. So you can browse dendy sets by using either name or like identifier. If you know the identifier, you can, you can um, order this uh, according to the identifier or name. But probably most of you, you will be using for like sp some specific things. And here we have like search, search field where you can, when you can, for, for example, search for like specific like author name, or you can, you can type the species 
that you want you are interested so for example let's type house house mouse so when you get to when you type house mouse you will have the subset of dentist sets now you see that you have like only four pages of different dentist sets that do have somewhere in the description house mouse so let's go to one of the sorry let's go to one of the dentist sets that was search that was found when we had like a house mouse so first you can first thing you can see that like you know mouse is already in the in the title of the dentist set but if we search you will also see that mouse is in the description in the keywords and possibly it can be also in the asset summary when you have the species so basically right now if you type here anything like species or like name of contributor it will search everywhere so either the mouse is in the keywords or in the title you will be able to find this to stand this set but there is something also like that you should keep in mind that you know if you wanna your data to be searchable you have to put the, uh, the specific uh, words in the keywords in the description or somewhere else so this is the landing page for this specific dentist sets. So um, you will see like basic information about the dentist sets right here. So first of all, you have a contact person. So if you have like any question, you know who to, who to write to. You also have information about the size of the files and the number of size and of files. And you have information where the dentist sets were created and when it was last updated. In this situation, it was, um, it's the same day, but you can have situation that, you know, people are like uploading more data or changing something. So the last update might be different than the, the day of creation. You have list of all contributors. You have short description, and this is mandatory, but you also can add some additional information. So here you have like keywords. So you have again, the mouse, you you have like cortex motor cortex you can basically have like as many keywords as you want uh, here is like a license we do require the license and i will show you later how to add specific license um, but also like we have um, additional information uh, that you authors can add to then this set so for example here you have like um in access information for access information we always have like then the open access but you can also add acknowledgement asset sum summary is created automatically by, by, based on your uh, on the files that you are uploading you can also uh, find information about funding about uh, protocols so basically some of this dentist said they have protocols that were created before the studies and you can access, for example, here, if you go here, you will see that this, this protocols was published in nature protocols and you can have like description, a specific description of the protocols. And you can also find related resources in this situation, uh, authors like added three different resources that you can access also um, and associated projects. So this is something that you can find on the main tab. There's also like on the right, you also have information how to, how to cite the data, how to download the data using Dendy CLI. And Dendy CLI is something that you will learn a bit more in the last session of this workshop. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you can also share your identity set using Twitter. And there's also like additional uh, button that is called metadata. So here you will see, sorry, okay. Mm, okay. Here you can see like some of the information that you could already access from the landing page, but you also could have like, could access more details. So for example, if you click to Denti contributors, 
you will have not only names, but you might also have like, in, not in the situation, but you can also have emails, you can have URLs, you can, you can have like all this information about the authors. So the, here you will find more details information about the metadata of the dentists. And if you want to download, you can click the download metadata and you will have all this information in the JSON format on your, on your computer. So the last thing, oh, I'm sorry. The last thing I want to say is like you saw all the, the files. So this is like here we were describing metadata, how to share the data, how to share the information about data, how to download. And here you have information about the, the files that are part of these dentist sets. And you will see you have like multiple folders for different subjects, and we can click to one of them. So here you see that all of these um, files are in N NWB format. So if you don't know the format, you will have like the second presentation will be, you will have a short introduction. But basically here you can, you have, you can click to download. Are we probably like stop this downloading because it's big? Or maybe it's this one, this one is actually not big. But you can also click I, where you have like more information, more metadata about this specific file. So you, you remember that uh, at the beginning I was showing you the metadata about uh, the dentist set. And here you have like metadata that is related to specific, specific uh, file. And because this is NWB file. The metadata was created uh, automatically using the information that people provide in NWB files. So, okay, so as I told you, I wanna you also to try to search uh, a bit. So um, you can go to public dentists and you can, uh, you can try to set for, search for anything you want. You can use the same. Um, you can use the same term as I was using, but you can you can try anything else, um, and you can click click on any of these twenty sets and try to try to figure out like uh, several information that I we uh, I we ask you in the polls. So one additional thing that I forgot to mention is that you can see that. Some of these dentist sets have draft, and some of these dentist sets have like blue icon with some specific version. So you can see that this is the difference between the, the dentist set that was officially published, and here you can have information about like when uh, it was published in specific version, because you can have uh, like new version in the future. And this data sets, you can see that there are no, uh, have not been published yet, and they, they are in the draft, um, draft version. So this is like the main difference uh, you will see. So um, maybe I will give you like now like four minutes, and um, I will show you a simple poll with you. So if you can try to search, if you can. Try to say, can you see the poll? Yes. Okay. So if you can try to search for any for any term you would like, and click on any dent uh, set you uh, you have uh, you, you want, and try to figure out first of all where was the uh, where was the term that you were searching in this description? Was it in title? or uh, in the description or in the keywords and try to figure out, try to find the basic components uh, from the landing page. And I will give you like three, three more minutes. And if you have any question, you can also like uh, unmute yourself and ask right now.
So also like if you have like any issue, if you are not able to interact with the um, web interface, you can also let us know now. Okay, you can still keep answering the poll, but here I can see how people are answering. So basically for the first question, where did you find the name of the species you were searching for? Um, basically like all answers are correct, you could find in, as in, my, in the example that I show you, like the mouse was like in Tendiset title, in the description, in asset summary and in keywords. It could be in any of this field to be searchable. Um, but yeah, you can have uh, also like all of them. So um, that's good that uh, in, in most situations we have involved in the indice title and description and asset summary. Uh, and it's actually good to provide as many information as, more, as specific as you can to your dentist set. The second question, um, the second question was uh, where you were able to find the specific thing. So I, I could see that like uh, many people were having pro problems with their license. So license is actually something that is, um, that is mandatory. So you should be able to see the license right here. And um, there's also like repeated here, but I believe that all, I mean, maybe not all, all then they said they have like a valid, um, valid metadata should have, should have uh, the, li the license information. Uh, for protocol, not, uh, definitely not all st studies um, provide protocols. It's not a mandatory field. Um, and how to cite, so last updates, it's always, as I showed, it's here. And to how to cite is part of the right panel. Um, yeah, okay, so, and the question was also, is it already published? So um, it could be either yes or no for people who couldn't find. I just wanna show once again that here you could have like either specific version like here, or you can have draft. And this is also part of the official identifier. So if you can see here, um, this is either like specific version or draft, and that's how you can see if the dent if the dentist set were was already published or not. Okay, I'll wait. Thank you for for part participating. So I will end the poll right now. And um, as I said, like the second part of the of my section will be like uh, to try to create your own new dentist set. And for this, because this is like our official 
uh, web uh, web interface. Uh, and because now we will be like just um, practicing and creating a testing data then they said we don't want you to create here so that's why we are providing another like copy of our uh, denti archive but it's called the staging uh, can someone type this also in the um in the zoom link please so do we have this Thank you, Satra. So you have this also like a link to in the in the chat, in the chat. But basically, this is like uh, GUI dash staging dot dot org. So here you will see that um, the, the public dentist looks really different um, because this is our like testing testing server and. You so, should not search for like real data here, but this is at the place where you can you can uh, test how to create new dentists. So I didn't mention at the very beginning. So you from the, at the very beginning, I was using the, the previous part. I was using the web interface without logging in. And now, if we want to create new dentist, we have to log in to the to the denti archive. So on the top right corner, you have logged in with, with GitHub. So this is the reason why we ask you in the email to create GitHub account if you don't have it yet. So if you click it now, I, I mean, in my situation, it was logged uh, in automatically. I think you will have like additional questions just to confirm um, your, your GitHub information. So once you are here, you see that I'm already logged in. And in, the, in addition to public dentists, I have a, like a new field that is my dentists. So if I go here, like I have like three different testing uh, dentists that um, they all actually all have like they're all empty, but I was just practicing creating a metadata. And this is something that we do right now. So here you have like, you can click now after you log in, you can click new dentist. And you see that um, there are two fields that are mandatory to create the name. So a uh, denti workshop, or we just put, you can put whatever you want and just this short description testing. And I can click register data set. And um, yeah, you can try to follow if you have if you have any any uh, problems with accessing this, you can uh, you can ask question now. But if not, I would like to see. So after creating this, after after providing uh, the name, the title, and the short information, I can already access the landing page for my dentist set. So you can see that I again I have my own ID. Um, I didn't publish this, so it is in draft version. I have like my short description and uh, there is like one contributor that it's me. And if it's like one uh, contributor, this is automatically provided as a contact information. And I'm also like ownership, uh, owner of this dentist set. Again, like you have the access information is always uh, denti open access. But if I want to add more metadata, I can click here, metadata. And here I can provide like more information. You see that the license is a mandatory field. So I can click and actually um, then the provides two options. So you can click one of this. And after you click, you can see that the, that the interface suggests that you should save this. Uh, there are other things that we can add. So keywords, we can add like okay, mouse, cortex, anything you want. Oh. Oh, oh, I think I should one by one. Um, but you can also like add contributors. So for example, here, 
um, you can see that the, the, I, I, my, I'm like automatically contributors, but I can provide addition, additional information. Uh, I can provide my orchid, but I also like just can add like a new person. So I will try to show, I will show you quickly how to add another person. So here you have like options. So the, if you have contributors, you can have either person or organization. So I will choose as an example person. And here you see that like, you know, we are asking for multiple fields. Not all of them are obligatory, but you know, the more information you provide, the better that um, will be like searchable later. So um, let's say, so here you also like, oh, I'm sorry. Again, the person. And also like you have like a, the eye icon so you can see the information. So for example, here you have like suggestion how we can provide the for format. So here is like family name, um, command given name. So for example, I wanna add Satra. I can provide his email. Um, and I can also like provide his orchid. So it's, it's easier to, to find later. So So this is something that probably all of you know. Um, this is like basic identifier for scientists. And this is something that we, we ask people in Dendi, I have to provide. Where is this? And you can also like provide to also, this is also like information. So you saw that if there is one, only one person at the beginning, I'm automatically, um, I'm automatically used as a contact person, but I can change later the contact person. I can add like that the Satra is outer, contact person, data co collector, data manager, and you can add as many as many roles as you want. And here, Copy this quickly again. Okay, to save it. So here you can see I can save it. I can return to contact page, and you should see that. Uh, that Satra is the second person added to my, uh, to the standy set. And you can be adding like more information like uh, using, um, using this form. So also like you can check, you can uh, add related resources. So for example, you can add publication here. You can add ethics approval here. You can have subject matters and always you can click on, uh, on this plus and you will have some like uh, we have some guidance how how to add the things what what are the options for the fields um we do not have time to add too many information but i think it would be great if you just you, you try to add like one thing at least like the additional for example addi addition additional contributor and you should see this later on your on your page. So I will give you, we are actually like uh, already uh, running out of time, but I will add, um, I will launch another poll. So if you can try to create your own Dendy set and add at least one field from the metadata. And the only question I will have right now is that um, if you can show if you were able to create that standy set or not. That would be very useful for us. You can see the direct question. So again, like this is the moment that if you want to ask question, you can just unmute yourself and, and talk to us.
If not, I will give you like two more minutes to create your own dendy set and, and add at least one metadata field. So also like, um, I will just mention one more thing. So you see here, uh, there is like a publish button that is not available for me. And there is also one, um, one end error. So um, basically it's saying that a dentist set containing no files or zero bytes is not publishable. Because right now we are only like adding information to dentist set. We are only adding metadata. We have not add any in the data content. So basically, uh, then the is not, not allowing you to publish. And in the next section, so actually maybe I should mention this, that um, in the next section, uh, Ben will add, uh, will show you how to add the content to this Denti, uh, Denti set. So it's even more important that if you wanna participate in the next section, it would be really nice if you can try to create Denti set right now. Okay, so the good news is that everyone who is trying to, at least to now, everyone who is trying to create and set, it looks like is able to succeed. Yeah, so I think I will stop right now. So again, like we have like five, 10 more minutes of break. So if you are having any any issue, you can still ask us and we can help you to create your own dentist set. But uh, after the break, you will have, uh, you will have a next session that then we show you how to add data and also how to use Denti Hub. Thank you. So should we start, should we start at 10 past, Satra? We, we should, but before we finish, one of the things I would love is for uh, everyone to log into the hub. So those who are planning to follow along with, oh, to hub. Okay. To, with Ben uh, to log into the hub. Um, and I'll share my screen one second. So to log into the hub, you will first need to be able to log into Dandy Archive. Uh, so make sure that you can sign in at dandyarchive.org and then you can go to the hub. And once you get there, you'll see a screen like this. And it uses the same authentication as you did for Dandy, which is why we asked you to create a GitHub account. And when you sign in, it'll give an option to select, just leave the default choice. The only thing I would want to point out over here is that the hub offers different kinds of resources depending on what you're trying to do at that moment. Uh, and the way the hub works is when you're not using it, when you've closed everything, it'll just shut itself down. So the resources are acquired as you try to use the hub. And this is why we are asking you to sign in now because it takes a little while to spin up these resources. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave the base thing in and hit start. I probably, there are probably enough resources for me for it to not say I have to wait, but if everybody signs in, it will require spinning up these resources. So that's why we are asking you to log in select the default thing and then hit start. Uh, yeah. I okay. saw a question which says, uh, I'm getting a 403 forbidden. Uh, I'm gonna ask, did you sign in to Dandy Hub first? So I would say that for everyone, uh, 
you know, we might have some break, but uh, Vera, if you wanna share. So we'll take a five minutes break. Those who are having trouble, if you could stay online and tell us if you have tried signing into Dandy Hub first, uh, no, sorry, Dandy Archive first before trying to sign into the hub. Oh, I think I figured out the problem. Um, we had started signing in through the uh, staging one. So we only logged in through staging, but if you log in through the main one that's not staging, then it should work. Correct. Oh, okay. So um, that's actually very, very useful. Thank you. So um, Sacha, you wanna, you wanna share your screen? To I will sh share my screen again. So you want to make sure that you sign on to the normal Dandy archive, which will take you to gui.dandyarchive.org. The staging one uh, uses a separate database. We are using it for testing and workshop purposes, but the hub is the production hub. And to use that hub, you need to have logged in to the normal Dandy archive. Uh, so if you just type dandyarchive.org in your browser, It'll take you to the normal archive. If you log in with GitHub there, you will be able to log in to the hub. So the question is, what server option should we choose? So uh, just use the default one. The default um, one is fine, yes. All right, so we're, we're starting again at 10 after, is that right? We're starting 10 after. So we'll take a five minute break and we'll come back uh, 10 after.
Hi, Ben. The good news is everybody who started pods, they're all running. Great. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Sounds like we're ready to go. <clears throat> all right. So hi, everyone. I'm Ben Dichter. I'm going to be taking over the next part of the tutorial. So I would say there are two main goals of this next part. One is uh, we're going to really take it where Dorota left off and um, and show you how to create NWB files and add them to a data set and then publish that data set. And the other goal is to show off um, the Dandy Hub, which we which many of you have now started. So the advantage of doing both of these at the same time is, um, well, Dandy Hub allows us to have an environment where we have all the necessary tools already installed so we can really hit the ground running with this tutorial. Uh, but it's also a really great resource that you could use outside of this tutorial. Um, it really, I think, takes Dandy to the next level beyond what you might expect for a standard archive. It really creates an entire collaboration space um, and, and a much more rich resource for interacting with the data that's shared on the archive. So, um, so this is going to be a tutorial also about using Dandy Hub. All right, so I'm going to just share my screen and get started. So, <clears throat> so once you start Dandy Hub, you'll be presented with a screen like this. And if you don't see the launcher, you can go file new launcher right here. And this brings you to a menu where you can choose a few different options to interact with the computational resources that you've now allocated. So, what we're going to use here is a Python based notebook. But I just want to point out that there are lots of different other ways that you can act or interact with these resources. You can have a Julia or an R notebook. Um, you can use desktop. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and this, so this brings up a full Linux desktop where if you had, for instance, an application that you programmed in, um, in PyQt, for instance, where it, um, it doesn't run on a browser, it runs, you need a, you need a desktop to run it, you can run it here. Um, and uh, we also have this Allen SDK. So this is a, a Python notebook where we're using a different environment. Um, and the Allen SDK pins to uh, an earlier version of um, PineWB and a few other libraries. So we have a special environment that, that gives you the latest version of Allen SDK. Um, and, but if you want the latest version of, of Pi and WB and HDMF and some of the other tools that we're using, um, we would recommend using this Python 3 environment. Uh, you can also interact with, uh, with just a console in several of these different languages. Um, and you have other tools as well. So you can interact with a terminal here that just opens up a standard command line interface. And now I've lost my launcher, it looks like. Okay, you just X out of that, you get the launcher again. Uh, so, <clears throat> so lots of different resources here to use it. Um, and I'm actually gonna run a poll now to see what, um, what way you think you might want to interact with, uh, with these resources. All right, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, so I'm sharing the results with you. So um, the majority of you said Python notebook. So I have good news for you because the rest of this tutorial is gonna be in Python notebooks, um, but a, a good number said a desktop or terminal. Um, yeah, those, those work perfectly well. We're also going to be using the terminal in this tutorial. Uh, we won't be using the desktop, but um, I'm interested to see the, the applications that people will, will get running on the desktop mode. Um, and we have a few Julia and R users. Um, lots of respect for those languages. We don't have any tools built in them right now, but 
um, we would love to hear from the people who use those resources to see maybe what packages you'd want pre-installed in those types of environments. Um, and so, so those are available. But I think it's going to require you to kind of do some initial setup on your own. Um, but yeah, really interested to maybe work with these people and see if we can help them make this a really useful resource for Julia and R. Okay, so let's go into the tutorial. Uh, if you go into Dandy Notebooks, um, so these are notebooks that are shared. Your, I think your directory is going to look quite a bit different, but you should have Dandy User Guide Part One. Let me look at the chat and make sure that you can someone confirm that you can see Dandy User Guide Part One. Uh, yes, you can install stuff. Yeah. All right, cool, great. So I'm going to close that. Okay, so now let's talk briefly about NWB. So Neuro Data Without Borders, or NWB, if you're not familiar, is a, um, a data standard that's supported by the Brain Initiative. And, um, and this is the data standard that, that Dandy requires neurophysiology data to be in. So if you have extracellular or intracellular electrophysiology or optical physiology or behavior data um, for, for animals and um, in kind of behaving experiments with often with neural recording going on simultaneously, um, your first step is going to be converting this data to neuro data without borders. Um, and the goal of this standard, NWB, is to be able to package all of the data with enough metadata to enable reanalysis of the experiment, ideally without having to go back and forth with the original experimenters. Um, so this includes neural activity, the actual voltage traces or DF over F traces, for instance, um, but it also includes information about data acquisition, the experiment design, um, the subjects, the, the behavior, and NWB has the robust extensions library that you can expand it to all sorts of other things as new technology comes available. Um, so as you can imagine, this is quite complex. And NWB basically, it, it provides a scaffolding or a standard structure that allows you to associate the metadata um, with data in a standardized way so that this can be um, this can be standardized across data sets, which enables group analysis of data across multiple studies. And it also allows you, enables you to build analysis and visualization and, um, and data scraping tools that will generalize across data sets. So um, honestly, converting data to NWB really requires its own workshop. And we just don't have time to go into details about all the different types of data um, that you might want to convert. So I'm just going to go through a simple tutorial um, really quickly of one example type of data. And then I'm going to point you to more resources where you can go in depth on your own and, um, and dig into how you would wanna convert your own. Okay, so um, I'm, we're gonna pay special attention to subject specific information because this is required by Dandy. Um, and I will show you where that goes and how that's being used. So here we're going to do some imports. We're using Pi NWB here. Uh, there's also Mat NWB, which is a, a MATLAB library for doing the exact same thing. Uh, but we don't, um, we're not yet running MATLAB on Dandy Hub. So you're going to have to use Pi NWB for now for this tutorial. Um, and, and keep in mind, I'm, we're running this on Dandy Hub, but I just wanted to point out that this runs perfectly well not on Dandy Hub. Um, but you are welcome to use Dandy Hub and Dandy Hub is pre-configured to have the appropriate packages already installed. So we encourage you to use Dandy Hub if it's convenient for you. So here's a, um, a function called create NWB file, which takes in a subject ID, okay? And so the first thing we're gonna do is create this NWB file object, um, which generally contains metadata about the session itself. So description, identifier for the session, the start time of the session, there's some optional information like the experimenter, lab, and institution. Um, and the next thing we're going to do is create this subject object. So we're going to set that to the NWD file. And subject um, contains the subject ID, which is what we pass into this function. And then we're going to say it's um, a mouse and it's 90 days old. So these are um, specific conventions that we use here. We prefer the Latin binomial nomenclature. So 
Um, so there's no ambiguity about what species is being, um, is being used in the experiment. And then this is an ISO 8601 duration format for age, which allows you to express age in days or years or minutes or seconds, depending on what the species is. Um, so, uh, so this subject information is particularly important because as, during the publication process, Dandy Archive will actually go into the NWB files and, and pull out um, all of this information and, help, and use it to create an asset summary and also use it to organize the files themselves. So we're gonna see that in a minute, but we're not gonna be able to do that without creating the subject information. So then we're gonna say this is an electrophysiology experiment with a single device. So, okay, we've got some, some device, um, some electrode group within the device, and then we're adding electrodes to the electrodes table. We're gonna say we have four electrodes implanted in the brain. Uh, and then the, we are gonna create an electrode table region, which is a way of referencing the electrodes that are implanted. Um, and then we're gonna randomly generate some data um, and timestamps for that data, and then create an electrical series, which is voltage traces over time um, and associate it using the electrode table, associate it with, uh, it, sorry, the electrode table region, but going to associate it with specific electrodes in the electrodes table, specifically electrode zero and two. Um, and then we'll add the ECE phys to the NWB file. So in all, we have an NWB file that contains some general metadata, some subject specific data, a device, an electrode group, um, specific electrodes, a, re a reference into that table, and then electrophysiology data from those electrodes. Now, again, NWB um, supports many different types of um, imaging modalities. I mean, we, we're not including any behavioral data here or any optical physiology or anything like that. Um, there are a lot of neurodata types that aren't covered in this very quick tutorial. I just wanted to get an NWB file together that we can kind of move forward with. Uh, but I would encourage you to check out these tutorials here um, if you're interested in converting your own data. Um, we have YouTube videos for many of these tutorials that really walk through step by step. Um, so we have reading NWB files, extracellular and intracellular electrophysiology, optical physiology, and advanced write tools. Um, and, uh, and if you uh, think NWB might not fit your needs, or if you want help in converting your data to NWB, we encourage you to check out the help desk. I'll just click that link here to show you. This is basically a discussion forum and you're welcome to start a new discussion um, to talk about maybe why you, you think NWB might not work for you or um, to ask questions about how to, how to get it to work for you. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. All right, well, that's just a function. All right, now we are in Dandy Notebooks. Okay. And so, so just a quick interruption. Uh, yeah. Could you just remind people if who are not familiar with the IPython notebook, how to run cells? Oh, yes, yes. So um, I use shift return or shift enter. Uh, I think that works on most operating systems. If that doesn't, you can always press this little triangle here. Um, so let's run this. Okay, so here I've created a directory called data. I've created an NWB file with subject one. And then um, I've written, I've, I've opened a file called ecephysexample.nwb and um, written the NWB file to that location. And if we navigate here to data, okay, it's it's been written a second ago. All right. Um, so now we have some example data that we can start um, integrating, uploading it to our example data set. Now, um, now we're going to need that example data set that you created in the first section. And again, I wanna remind you, we're using the GUI staging and, the, and again, the reason for that is when you create a data set, you are given a unique uh, dandy set ID. And uh, on, the, on the actual server, we'd like to, as much as we can, reserve those for actual data sets. 
Uh, but you can use the GUI staging to create as many example data sets as you want and kind of play around with the tools. So we're going to go here. And then, OK, so uh, one thing we're going to need is our API key. So you click on your little initials in your circle, and that should reveal this. And then you press the little uh, rectangles to copy this to your clipboard. We're going to need that to upload data. OK. Uh, and then if you haven't already, you're going to need to create a new data set. I'm going to create one right now, but you can use the one that you've already created if you want to. OK. Um, all right, so we're also going to need um, the terminal for this. So I have this launcher window open here. Again, if you don't have that open, you can go to new launcher, and that's going to launch this window. And then you just press here, which gives you a terminal. OK, so far so good. I'm going to check the chat to see if anybody has any issues so far. All right, let me know in the chat if you have any problems. OK, <clears throat> now we need to set our environmental variables for the Dandy API key. So you want to go into terminal and write export space Dandy underscore API underscore key equals your key here. And it should look something like this with your key. You can paste it in here. Now, one thing that um, is kind of a gotcha here is that you're not allowed to have spaces on either side of the equal sign. Uh, if you do, this command will not work. So export and the API key equals your key. Don't copy my key. Um, and then you, and then just to confirm that that worked, you could do echo dollar sign dandy API key. Okay, if that prints out your thing, that it should work. Where did the key come from? The key comes from, you click on your initials and then you copy this. This is your key. This copies it to your clipboard and then you can paste it in. No problem. All right. Okay, now the next thing we're going to need is your, um, is the URL of the data set that you just created. So go over there and go ahead and copy that. Now we need to go over back over to our terminal window. Oh yeah, I forgot. You can you can actually reposition these so you can look at both at once. That's way more convenient. Okay. So uh, right. So next thing we need to do is download that data set. But let me. Well, wait. Where am I? Here. Okay, that's fine. So dandy download. That should do it. OK, so here we go. It's just downloaded the YAML file that just create that has that initial setup metadata. And then um, we're going to CD into it. CD. This created a directory called uh, with the, the name of the directory is the number of the dandy set. So 100792. Yours will be a different number. OK, now Dandy has a way of organizing data. So in addition to the NWB standard, um, Dandy has a standard for naming the files that, um, that is similar to uh, bids. And it, the way that it, it does this is that it goes into the NWB file and, and pulls out the session IDs and the subject IDs in order to do this. Um, and, and what it does is it creates soft links from those initial files uh, to a standardized structure. So it doesn't actually copy the data. It just creates kind of a, um, a just links to the data in the correct format. So dandy organize. So we're going to point it to that data. Um, the directory number. So the directory number is the number of the dandy set. Does that help, Joyce? Um, all right. All right. 
dry. Okay. And then in the organize. Oops. And now let's just go navigate to here. Now, one thing to note is that the working directory of all of these things are different. So the working directory of this is different from the working directory of this is different from the working directory of this. Um, so just keep that in mind. So we need to refresh this. And 507 is the one that we want. OK, so after running that organize command, um, we have this, um, we now have data in here that is a link to, um, to the original data file. And here you see a subject 001. We created a subject called 001 right here. So it's taking that key and it's creating a subject folder, and then it's creating a session within that subject folder, an NWB file. All right, so this is how we want it. We just have a single subject and a single session right now. So, uh, and then we have this dandy set.yaml, which is our metadata. Now, um, now we wanna actually upload it. Um, so this will, again, only work if you have already um, given dandy your API key. So uh, we're gonna do dandy upload and we're gonna have this initial option, which is minus I, dandy staging. So this is just an initial flag that's like, okay, we're not doing it to the actual production server, we're doing it to staging. If we weren't in um, on this example uh, staging server and you wanted to do the real thing, this command would just be dandy upload. You don't need to do any minus I. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy this and paste it down here. All right, so it skipped the YAML because it's exactly the same as what's up there. Um, and it actually doesn't let you edit it manually um, locally. Uh, and then, yeah, it has uploaded this example file, okay? So if we go here, it still says zero, but if we refresh the page, okay, we have 218 kilobytes, one file, All right? So let's navigate through here. We can see our, if we go to files, we see that this directory structure has been mirrored here. That looks good. Um, now, if I try to publish this, I can't. And that is because it, we're, we're failing metadata. So I have not added a license. So let's go ahead and fix that issue and say CC by. This is what I generally use as CC by because I like it to make sure that people will cite me. Okay. Um, Let's do that. And then, oh, uh oh. Uh, Satra, do you remember how we fixed this? I, I think you just need to refresh the other page. Oh, okay. Let's, let's try that. Yep. No. Um, it's there. I this is. I will check with the other folks on this. Why don't you go ahead and I'll ping you here. Okay. So another thing we um, we want to do here is let's say we have a co-author of this data set. We want to add them. So when we do that is we're going to go back to metadata. Dandy set contributor. Let's add a contributor. We'll say it's a person. Um, John Doe. And okay. Now um, I've, I'm going to save that. Let me go back here. Now I've intentionally made a mistake here. Um, it won't, 
the data has not been validated. Schema key. Hmm. Okay, I know how to fix that, Ben. So let's go right. hit metadata. Hit access information. And then hit edit, the edit button there. And for the moment, just hit OK. That's I'm it. Out of it. And save. You probably have to refresh that because that takes a little background process to check. It's still checking, so we'll wait. Okay. And now you can go back and refresh. At least I see it on my uh, side. Okay. So this is a this is the error that we actually wanted. <laughs> because I intentionally, when I created this contact, I said John Doe, which is incorrect. So let's look here. And you said contributor. Um, okay, so you see how the name here is Victor comma Ben. It needs to be last comma first. And if you don't have that, it's going to throw an error. So let's go back and fix this to, we'll say Smith comma John. And then, okay, get out of here, save that, navigate back, refresh the page. It's going to take a minute. Publish. Aha, it's green. Hooray. OK, so now we have a valid data set that we can publish with data and two authors. We see Ben Dichter and John Smith. Um, and this is green. But before we do that, let's go back. Okay, uh, I want to add more data to this. I just created hot off the press a new file. So we're going to generate a new subject of data. Um, now, it's important to note if this were exactly the same file, um, then it would, uh, then Dandy would, would notice that it's exactly the same file and not upload an exact duplicate. But it's not exactly the same file because I'm randomly generating data here. So it's actually going to be a different, different values of the file. Um, so I'm going to create another, um, another NWB file. So let's go navigate to that and confirm that that actually happened. OK, we've got two NWB files here. We're going to do uh, dandy organize again. Okay, let's move over to our number and um, I'm in the wrong number. That's why. Okay, there we go. And then let's upload again. Now, one thing to note here is that this first one is skipped because Dandy sees that it's exactly the same file as it already exists. So you don't upload data just to have it be exactly the same. It's, it's smart enough not to do that. But if you change the file, it will upload a new version. And if you add a file, it'll, of course, upload that. So let's go over to our dandy set and uh, refresh the page. Okay, good. Two files, we've increased the storage. All right. And now, yeah, now let's just publish it. All right, confirm that we're on GUI. No, so we're not publishing chunk to the, uh, oh, we can't publish yet because it needs to, parse through this and make sure it's all and and uh, extract the metadata from it. Presumably that's still going on. So this is grayed out as it's 
um, as it's validating the file, but it should validate soon. There we go. And now we can publish. So this saves a persistent state of the data. You can think of this a lot like a software release. Um, so here we go. Here's the persistent state that will always be there. Uh, but you can continue to add data to this and publish new versions of it. Um, the advantage of, of publishing is it really gives a persistent state for somebody to cite and say, this is exactly the, the data set that I'm using. Um, but it, it shouldn't prevent you from um, adding more to this data set or fixing things that um, are mistakes that you've found. Uh, we would prefer if you didn't publish like 10 times in a row. Like try to get everything in order before you hit publish. But you're, if you have actual contributions or corrections to make, feel free to, to uh, create updates. OK, <clears throat> so now we have this NWB file uh, uploaded. And so now I want to show you how we interact with these files. So there's this tool called NWB widgets, which allows you to interactively view NWB files. So I'm just going to import NWB widgets and then run NWB2 widget on first thing is just this NWB file that exists in memory that we just created here. So we'll run it on that. And then this shows you um, a hierarchical view of the NWB file. So the, the session level metadata, uh, the subject specific data, uh, device electro group, um, and you can actually start viewing the uh, electrophysiology data. Now we just randomly generated two traces. So not much to see here, but you kind of get a sense for how this could be useful for real data. <clears throat> so um, another really cool feature of, um, of the Dandy archive and, and NWB widgets and the Dandy hub, how everything kind of links together is that you can stream data directly from the archive to um, analysis, including widgets. So, um, so here I'm gonna direct us to an example file that is on published dandy set 53. And here's the file path. This is optical physiology calcium imaging from the Geocoma lab. It's a 30 gigabyte file, um, but we're not actually gonna download 30 gigabytes. So what we're gonna do here is use the, uh, the Python client of the dandy API to pull the S3 URL of this file. And then we're going to, uh, I'm just gonna open up this file using nwbhdf5.io. Um, and instead of directing this to a file path, we're directing it to the S3 path. And if we say driver equals ROS3, that stands to read only S3. And these files are stored on S3 storage. So um, this sets up an interface where N and PyNWB can stream data um, directly from the S3 bucket instead of reading it locally. And then we're gonna just pass that directly to NWB widgets. So we'll do that. So this sets up a pipeline where you can interactively explore NWB files stored on the Dandy archive without having to download or install anything. So we can go to acquisition. And here we can actually see, we can explore through the images that were collected here. And then if you go down to processing, OFIS, fluorescence, ROI response series, now we can navigate through the, um, the ROI response series. Let me just do 50 seconds so we can actually see something going on. All right, so here you can see a standard ROI response. Getting a question from Chris. I'm getting error message in my organized process. Module has no attribute. Um, yeah, Chris, I would recommend uninstalling Pi and WB and HDMF and then reinstalling them. Um, I get dandy set ID is not defined. Hmm. Um, James, I'm not sure what step you're on. Oh, yeah, you have to remove the hashtag. Yeah, that's true. 
Let me know if you're con con continuing to have that problem, James, and we can search out. Okay, let me just show a little bit more about NWE widgets so you can see how you can interact and explore these files. Uh, I'm just gonna show you um, this pretty cool thing that we developed that uh, was developed in collaboration with Kitware. So the Allen Institute um, released NeuroPixel data sets where they um, indicated the, um, the position of each electrode in CCF coordinates. So we have a 3D visualizer that allows you to view the, um, the placement of the NeuroPixel arrays on, um, on the CCF brain. All right, so if we go to electrodes, CCF. I'm gonna close this thing. And then here we are. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five different neuropixel probes implanted in a mouse brain. And you can do a little, there's a little rotate option. Okay. So you can see that with Jupyter um, Hub and with Dandy Archive and with the streaming, um, the possibilities for data visualization and, and streaming are really endless. Let me see another data set. Uh, I'll show a data set from the Buzaki lab that has some behavioral stuff in it as well. And again, these are really big files. And if you were to download the whole file, it would take a while. Um, but we're only streaming in the data that's necessary for the visualization with all these visualizations. So anytime data comes into view, that's when it's requested from the server. So you can um, you can open up very big files as long as you're not reading all of the data from those files. Um, it works pretty fast. Okay. Now let's go to processing. Give me the position. Let's go to this one. This is like a figure eight maze that the animal is running through. All right. So here we can just view X and Y over time. Um, and then you can also view it x versus y. OK, so here's uh, you see kind of one run through the maze. If we make this 100, you probably see the full thing. Okay, there you are. Yep, that's the full maze. Okay, so I mean, feel free to kind of navigate through different um, NWB data sets on Dandy. I mean, all you would need to do is go to dandyarchive.org and um, just search NWB here. And that's going to give you all of the neurophysiology data sets that are in, the, in, the, in NWB. Um, and then all you need to do is just swap in a, a different Dandy set ID and a different path. And then you can open any of these files in NWB widgets. Um, and then I'll pass this over to Satra, who wants to show you another really awesome way that you can visualize interactively data stored on Dandy. Thanks, Ben. 
Uh, I know we have a break coming up. This won't take a whole lot of time, I, but I wanted to demonstrate another type of data that we are storing on Dandy and how to visualize it. So I'm gonna share my screen very briefly. Uh, so the data set that we are dealing with over here is one of these uh, giant microscopy data sets at 90 terabytes. Uh, and what we're going to be visualizing is just a piece of it. Now, even this piece uh, has about 2.7 terabytes of data. It's organized in the single session. There are multiple stains in it, and each stain added up is about a terabyte. Uh, I'm gonna be using this notebook that Lee prepared, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, the hub again. So what we are hoping is that people who design analyses and applications on top of Dandy sets contribute back to the example notebooks repo on Dandy, uh, which translates to this Dandy notebooks folder that you have been seeing on the Dandy hub. Uh, so the data set in question over here is 000108. Um, if we go into it, it gets eventually to a demo script. And this is what's shown over here. I'll collapse away the file view. And I've run the script already. I'm not expecting you to run it right this minute. This was mostly to demonstrate. And this involves, uh, this particular data collection involves taking slices like this, clearing them out, staining them with multiple stains, collecting the data and uploading it. What I want to show you is, uh, Lee has written this fantastic notebook on how to stitch together these volumes that's uploaded. What I wanted to demonstrate is that you can interact with other external applications in the hub or applications that are, that are created by someone else in the hub. So here is the example of this stitched volume alongside the photo of the tissue that, that was imaged. Neuroglancer is a tool that allows kind of 3D visualization of this data. And this next piece of code, all it does is takes that volume that has been stitched and runs Neuroglancer to display it. And all of this is running on the hub. So this URL, if I click on it now, will take me uh, to an instance of Neuroglancer running in the hub in a private URL and displaying now a full 3D interactive setup for displaying the volume. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Neuroglancer, it's a viewing tool created by some folks at Google for visualizing large 3D data sets. That's one primary purpose. The secondary purposes are you can do computation on it and update this visualization through this programmatic tools. So we've taken the data stitched by Lee's code in the notebook and simply sent it to this visualizer. And now you have a full 3D visualization of this data in the hub. And this allows you to now add on all other kinds of computations. So for example, if you wanted to remove some artifacts from this data, you could run it through a processing and then visualize it. The other part of this is, this is still using kind of the streaming setup that uh, Ben showed just now in the notebook. We are not actually downloading a terabyte of data right this minute to do this. In fact, this data set is structured in multi-tiered resolutions of data. And we are simply reading in some of the, the coarsest resolution data for the purpose of this display and stitching it together into a single slice and displaying it. Uh, so I wanted to put it out there because I know some folks in the audience are interested in how Neuroglancer might uh, kind of connect to the visualizations of things. And now you have an example that's in the notebook that you can play with and extend in all kinds of ways that you are interested in to work through. I will say I tried running this visualization on a different level and you'll have to get out of the default setting uh, that you're currently using for your server option to create a larger memory option to be able to use this for a higher resolution sample. Uh, so I will stop there and I know we have a break. So I'm gonna give people a five to six minutes break. And at present, I think we are scheduled to meet back at 1 p.m. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to post it on chat or as some of you have been doing on the Dandy help desk. And there is a poll in place.
And for those of you who had some trouble with following along, uh, I would suggest we kind of take it offline in terms of connecting with us to see what trouble you ran into. Uh, again, our intent was by doing it all in the hub that we are hoping everybody has the same environment and other things, but there might have been a step missed here or there uh, that's necessary for things to work. Um, Yeah, it's a lot of steps. <laughs> We're happy to, to help you. We realize it's like a 10 step process, you know, get the API keys and all of that. So yeah, it can get complicated, but um, happy to work one-on-one -on -one as well. And I will say that all of this, all of the material is online as you're working with it right now. And the videos will be posted soon after once we've got a chance to uh, download and edit it. Uh, so you should be able to go through it again and- Could you? Could you please comment on the, you know, when they edit, because they will see the original uh, notebook that uh, Ben prepared for them, but uh, the things that you edited during the session, they might disappear, yeah? They won't disappear the way Dandy Hub works right now. Oh, okay. Uh, it is a Git repo, so it will stay. Uh, the changes will stay and any updates will be merged in. Now, there's a possibility that if Ben makes some changes, that there's a merge conflict that's normal with software. Uh, but in terms of the edits, things are persistent at this point in time. So basically, but I was just suggesting that maybe if you want to work on this, uh, you can also like copy the, the Jupyter notebook and just start your own analysis. Yes, uh, it's a full-fledged environment. You can Git clone anything from GitHub in a separate location. Uh, so you have the flexibility of doing all the things that you would normally do on your computer. So I should stop, give people the, at least a three minutes break and we'll see folks in a few minutes uh, for the next part.
guess we turn off this green screen. Hello again, everyone. I hope you had a nice break. Let's rejoin. And the next part four will be also done from a notebook, which you could find similarly to what Ben presenting in the previous part, which could be found on GitHub and also on our hub of the Indie archive. Let me start sharing the screen. Now you could see what I see. Um, I hope you can see it. The rotor, yes? Yeah, good. Okay, so the end user guide part two, IPython notebook would be the one which we will follow in this section. And in can the previous just, ones. Can you uh, just show how to get there? Oh, sure. So in your um, hub, if you open the hub, there is a folder, Dendy Notebooks. And if it got updated anytime recently, then you would get Dendy User Guide Part 2. If you want to update it and you didn't, I don't know, we could try. And for that, you open the terminal. Let me close or collapse this. If you open the terminal and you end up typically in your home directory, but then you could do dendy notebooks. And if there is no part two, you could do git pull. And then with that git pull, you will fetch a new version, which you could open later on in, um, in this folder, right? So you just find dendy user part two. Okay. So in the previous sections, we, you interacted already with web UI, which is web browser interface pretty much. And you already use the ND client command line interface, right? To download the initial um, data set, which you, the ND set you created on the archive. And you even use the ND library, Python library, to access sample files um, directly from within Python interpreter of your notebook. Um, so part of the, knowledge here is that both the uh, dendy client command line interface and python library are provided by the same package called dendy which you could find on uh, pypy which is where you install by using pip install dendy also we provide conda packages so if you're a user of conda environments you could also conda install dendy from conda forge channel and Underlying code base is all open source, available on GitHub, uh, available under that URL. So in this part, we'll just explore a little bit more of the ND common line interface and Python library functionality, but also introduce you to the ND archive API server, which allows you to interact with the archive from any programming language or even without programming language, but just using shell. Um, but also, let's say if you're a MATLAB user and you want to interact from MATLAB, you could probably easily um, interact with the archive um, using API directly. So Dendy command line interface. We have also Dendy handbook, the URL is provided here, which you reach by going to Dendy uh, archive.org and then documentation. This one provides you also with examples on how to use uh, Dendy client for various purposes. 
but to, today we'll just look into a few options and a few commands which it provides. And for those who are not very familiar with common line interface, the main piece of knowledge to know is to how to ask for help from a command. So, and majority of commands which you run in your terminal should provide uh, basic documentation or basic instructions how they are supposed to be used by running that command dash dash help. And the indie client is not an exception. So we provide such output uh, when you run the indie help. And as you saw in the previous notebook, typically in this Jupyter notebook, because it's Python based, it would use Python to interpret commands. But if you prepend with exclamation point, it will run it in a shell. So like if you were doing it in a terminal, right? So in the terminal, I could type dnd help and I'll obtain the same output as you could have could see uh, in the notebook. So it just provides you convenience. As you can see, <clears throat> overall syntax for invoking dandy command line interface is quite simple, right? So there is dandy command, then some global options such as controlling, let's say, log level. If you want to get more information about, uh, let's say, debugging information, you could specify higher level of logging and you'll receive more information. Then you specify command to run, and there is a list of commands which dandy client supports. You already saw download to download the empty dandy set but there is also commands to delete or calculate files that digests which is checksums pretty much also organize data set uh, which you saw in the previous section and upload data and also validate data if you are savvy shell user or not uh, shell completion will output you um, command which you could use to provide completion within common line for this client. But moreover, for any of those commands, you could also type that dash help after that command. So in this case, the NDLS that dash help provides more detail about that particular command, in this case, ls. And what it says that, oh, this is command to list NWB files and then this sets metadata. And it provides you also a number of options how to interact with that command. So there is global level options and there are options which apply specifically to a command. So whenever you type dandy command dash dash help, it will output options only specifically for that command. So first exercise would be to try dandy ls command on a dandy set you created in the previous section. So if I go to the terminal and if I remember correctly, there was data folder actually in my case i didn't download any i didn't create um dandy set but in your case you could try dandy ls on that folder or a specific file like in my case it would be this uh example which was also created in the previous section and what by default it tells me is just outputs uh the metadata which it extracted from that file and this metadata is not necessarily the metadata you would see on the web for each asset. We are working to harmonize it, but <clears throat> this is something which uh, we had originally for listing the files. And as you could see from dash, uh, then DLS dash dash help, it provides also various formats how to output this metadata. By default, when you provide a singular file, it just provides it in a YAML uh, standard. But you could say also JSON, JSON pretty print, but also there is PYOT uh, or PyOut interface, which is the interface providing you tabular view of metadata. In this case, because the table is too wide and terminal is too narrow, it doesn't really fit into the screen. Okay, uh, let me get back to the notebook after we practiced just using the NDLS, uh, here we go. And as I've mentioned, table gets busy, right? And if you want to just limit to a specific set of fields, you could uh, specify them again in the option for LS command, which will then provide a little better limited if it worked. Uh, age wasn't part of this metadata, but session ID, oh no, here is age and session. So you, if you have many, many files, which are NWB and metadata is not depicted in the file name, 
you might want to use the NDLS command to provide you this listing, like listing for files is regular LS command and uh, listing for metadata within the NWB files would be the NDLS command. Moreover, the NDLS command uh, can operate also on directly on the ND sets which are online. So in this case, let's say uh, I went to a particular Dendy set, right? And you could provide that URL as you could see it uh, on the in the web browser uh, address to the NDLS. And you could also provide it not only to an entire folder, but also to a specific file if you care. Let's say if there is 1.6 gigabyte file online and you don't want to download it just to see it metadata, you could copy a link address and paste it in, into the NDLS command and it will provide you uh, metadata which is available for that particular file. And there is a command to try, so we could try on that command. So in this case, we are getting metadata about particular asset as it's stored in, in, on, in the Dendy archive. This file is not available locally. We are interfacing with Dendy LS into archive, getting the metadata and displaying it for you in the show. Okay, so LS is a simple command which is to help you to list some metadata either in the files locally or from the archive. But most probably frequently used command is Dendy download, which downloads either entire Dendy sets or it downloads individual folders or individual files from the archive. And again, as with any command, you could type Dendy download dash dash help to get help information for that command or which options it supports and how it should be invoked. As you can see, one of the important options is actually how to treat existing files because let's say you've downloaded a file already before right you're analyzing it let's say and then you're running download again what should happen if let's say a file was changed locally or uh, changed in the archive and to be safe our default behavior is issue an error so if you downloaded something and you're trying to re-download it we're just issuing an error if it already exists. So you might want to modify or provide specific option uh, for dash E or dash dash existing. And uh, by default, we'll use PyOut interface, which will provide you the tabular view of, uh, of the Dendy set. And you could download either entire Dendy set. Let's say in, in, in the previous section, you just typed Dendy download dandy colon whatever that or url to the staging dandy set and if that dandy set had any assets they would be downloaded too but maybe in some cases you want to ignore any other any other assets and just go for dandy set yaml then you could specify with such option that i don't want to download 10 terabytes of data i just want to download the basic dandy set yaml so this option would be very useful and Sync option is also uh, could become handy if you want also to automatically delete local assets which were let's say removed on the remote uh, server. And if you mistype your URL or identifier of what you want to download from, it will provide you the same list of supported URLs or patterns to URLs uh, which Dendy client understands to point to Dendy archive. So which could be those. Uh, URLs from the website or uh, identifiers.org URL or uh, various other URLs we support and also resource identifiers such as dandy column and then identifier. Note though that in this case we will be talking specifically about our main deployment and not the stage in archive which you might be using now for practicing. For that one just copy paste a URL from the browser for your stage in archive. And so first example or exercise would be to download the entire Dendy set 27, which is a test Dendy set. So if you open it up, you will see that uh, that Dendy set is quite small, right? Altogether, size is just 18 kilobytes. 
So I would give you a minute maybe. Uh, how would you download the entire dandy set 27? And meanwhile, I'll just do it as well in my terminal. So let's say in this data directory I have, I could do dandy download, and I could either, uh, this is another big one, this one we don't need. Oh, and this one, I could have set that dandy column 27, right? And the result would be the same as if I pasted that URL from the browser. And so you could see it provided this tabular interface where if it was a bigger than the set, let's say go 29 is also not too big. You could see that it updates it dynamically while downloading uh, data. And if we start with something really big, I believe 26 is huge. You could see that it will populate and uh, update you as more and more data coming in. Okay, we don't want probably to pollute this poor hard drive with more data. But the point is with this dandy download command was to make it really easy to download data from the archive and it was doesn't want to die. We'll, we'll take care about that. Okay, and in this case we downloaded, tried to download the entire archive. Um, also, there is an exercise, let's say, download a draft version of the uh, of this 20, 27. And that is where the URL actually could come really handy. By default, we are downloading the most recent version. And then for draft version, we would need to provide the URL which would point specifically to draft. So if I go back to terminal and it finally died. And remember I've mentioned that um, there is this one already downloaded the most recent version. So I'll rename this one to download one and then the download and then paste the URL, which I didn't copy. This will download again 27, but now of the draft version, which might have progressed beyond the point which published version uh, was published at. And actually next exercise was probably to download a folder. No, the next one was actually, what's the difference, right? Between those two versions. And if you're uh, not familiar with commands which are available on majority of uh, Unix environments, then there is a command diff, which could give you difference between two folders, let's say. And uh, those options, of course, are there to just make it look better. And again, how do we ask for help? You could always ask help from majority of the commands this way, which will list you many more options and you could find what those options which I gave mean. And now we'll look in the difference between those two folders actually. There is no difference. So whatever I downloaded first was a draft. Let's download then a version which was published. Let's say we'll go to this particular version. Let's download this version. And I'll again, this one we can remove because it's the same. But if I do dandy download for particular published version, dandy set, and then do my diff command again, we can see that this dandy set changed in the file dandy set YAML. So it's metadata of the dandy set was changed after it was published. And we have some changes in this draft version as such as says that what it was published with and uh, schema version. So I'm going probably the other way around. No, the new one has published version, right? And then draft is the original one download one okay enough of this and let's now maybe download a specific folder if we go to this simple dandy set which has only one folder but if i select this url and also just paste it into dandy download command what we'll obtain is we will download only that folder 
So whenever you need to download a specific folder, not just the entire dandy set, you could also point to that location. And as we instruct here, there is multiple ways how which URLs support or resource identifiers support referencing specific path within the ND set. So you could point to, let's say, just say dandy colon, dandy, and then dandy set ID at which version, and then give it a path to download a specific path. Okay, so we download this and we'll, we used 27 as our example for downloading a specific folder. And specific file could be also downloaded by just copy pasting the URL from, uh, not, not from three dots, I'm sorry, but just from download button and we copy link address and in the terminal then we could do dnd download and this particular file that will download us only that particular nwd from within that folder and you could see that we have now this file we have this folder and we have entire dnd set downloaded too so with dnd download you have full control of at which level you want to download Another useful command after you created your, uh, let's say, NWB file, you could validate conformance of uh, metadata present in that file, first of all, to NWB that everything is um, consistent, but also that it conforms to metadata which we require in the ND archive. And for that, you could use the ND validate command. As any other command, it has dash dash help, but in this case, it doesn't provide many options, right? Besides, that there is option dash dash help and but how it works right it's you point it to the files to be validated so in this example we could validate let's say this sample file although this one might not be even maybe it will not even be entirely valid let's try because it's one of the all this nwb files there we go this file has nwb version uh, nwb validation errors because it's of old NWB version. But if we give it a sample file, which we've created in previous part, which would be what it was, ACV's example. In this file, you'll get that there is no validation and errors were detected in this file. So then the validate is a useful command. Okay, and at this point, probably we should run a poll to figure out if there is, oh, by the way, I've forgotten to mention <laughs> all those URLs which are supported uh, by dandy client commands, they're up there for your convenience. So dandy client supports all of those URLs, but if you are to cite dandy set, you better not use those, any of those, let's say, you shouldn't use web UI URL, but you should use URL which is provided in the citation which is actually DOI uh, URL at the end, right? So when you cite the indie sets, please use DOIs. If, um, if it's not yet published, then it becomes trickier, right? Because we provide DOIs only for published indie sets with the versions, but at least you could use uh, identifiers, I believe, .org, maybe without version, because there is no version, you're using draft version, but use identifiers.org, dnd column, and then ID in your citations. Okay, now let me figure out where I could run the poll. And there is a poll and it says, Dorota, could you help yeah. out? With yeah, I will, I will do it. Can you say it? I see it now. I'll give it a minute and then we'll go to the next session.
either questions are too hard or everybody is still out for lunch. I also uh, like maybe we can give a bit more time. It's long. Yeah. Okay, we have a good number of answers and just to make it clear, judging from the answers. <laughs> um, so these are the only commands which are dandy client supporting at, uh, at the moment. So uh, how to check which command supports, again, type just dandy dash help and it will output the commands which are supported by dandy client. They are listed right at the end of it. And fortunately, or unfortunately we don't have 22 commands yet we have only nine so nine was correct answer and what actions you could perform with the client uh, we used to be able to create dandy sets on the archive and actually it's still available but hidden but it typically you don't create dandy sets with the command line interface you would go to the web ui and create them on the web ui on the corresponding instance either it's staging or the main instance you go and create the indie set there instead of using the client. But you could use a uh, delete command to delete uh, files and download files and organize files. So all the rest of the answers, uh, those, are, those are correct. And let me re reiterate that uh, the indie download or LS doesn't support DOI URLs here. Uh, so for download, you would need to use, let's say, URL from the browser or some canonical identifiers URL. Uh, but for publication, for citations purposes, you should use published dandy set DOI if it was published. So you cannot use just any of those and paste them into your paper because that will just complicate things. Let's say if you paste it, well, identifiers should be persistent, but again, it's third party uh, kind of project and better to use DOIs and use identifiers only if there is no DOI for danger set. Okay, I think we could stop this poll. Now let's get back to this part. And all this dandy client interface is actually using underneath the same Python library, which you can use directly from Python. And you could solve it in dandy user uh, guide part one, which uh, was presented by Ben right before, right? That we imported from Dandy, Dandy API, we imported this class, Dandy API client. And that is the class which provides you with the interfaces you could use for inter interacting with archive. So all together, if you're familiar, oh, by the way, that, that would be a good thing to do probably. We should have run a poll, but do you know how to raise your hand? Please you raise your hand if you know a little bit of Python programming. So if you program in Python or script in Python, please raise your hand. And those who don't know how to raise the hand, that I guess varies also across different operating systems on this system. But typically it is in, um, what is it? Uh, not emotions. Gee, where is it? Reactions. 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 So in reactions, you could raise your hand. I know how to program in Python. I raise my hand. So there is a handful, not that many people who know Python, unfortunately. Python is great. We will not convert you to Python, but 
I think you should learn it because more and more uh, scientific tooling is done in Python in, as opposed to MATLAB, especially in neuroscience. Okay, thank you for your feedback and your raised hands. Let's continue. And all interactions with this archive, they go through this Dandy API client, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, which has a number of commands which could be um, asked for <laughs> to uh, perform operations on the, on, on the server. And if we go to the documentation, we provide documentation for not only for common line interface, but also for Python interfaces. So if you click on the link for Dandy Dandy API, you'll encounter and documentation eventually, which provides you overview of methods which should be used to interact with archive. And it also provides you an example code, which might sound a little bit complicated, but we probably will not leave it as an exercise, but we could go through it together and try to create our first Python code to implement the answer which is asked here, right? So that example which I opened, it already provides you pretty much the solution. And let's edit that example just to list all dandy sets in the main instance of the archive. So if I go back to this page, right? First, as Python works, right? We need uh, to do our import of what command we want to use. And I'll enter my code in this cell by pressing enter, pasting this line. And since I know how to paste more, I'll create this so-called context manager, which is a block of code under which this client will be available to us. And IPython notebook is smart. So when I pressed enter, it immediately indented my code where it should be. And now there is a loop where we could just print those dandy sets and let's see what we'll get. Instead of just doing this, well, we could do it even this way and print dandy set, although this one might not be pretty. Let's see what we'll get. And shift enter runs it. So here we go. With so much code, we pretty much implemented the NDLS command, right? We listed which dandy sets are available on the website or in the archive. And as I've mentioned that uh, by default, we return published version if there was published one and it was more recent than uh, the draft. So you could see that, oh, the Indy set three is at this published version and we present the information. And all those dandy set objects are actually not just a string, there are Python objects which could be used for further purposes. That's why in this code, let's say we later ask, oh, what is your most recent published version, right? Uh, or give me a dandy set, uh, this dandy set for another version, right? Or give me the assets of this dandy set. So this is so-called object-oriented programming. So we've got the object dandy set, and we can query it for specific additional information about that object. So all of the Dandy API interface is implemented in this object-oriented way. Okay, so following the original example, get an object representing Dandy set of interest to you. So in this case, I went through all the Dandy sets, right? And now I am just asking you to create, let's say, uh, to, to query the one for Dandy set 06 and download one using, as, uh, using download its assets. And 06 though, how big that one is? Why did I ask for 06? Let's see if we go in the archive. Public Dandy sets. Oh, this one is not that big, 139, okay. Now, we have documentation. So this documentation provides all the methods which we could use. And now we just need to figure out which 
method would return us a dandy set, right? For 006. Then the API client is the, is the object which we are operating. We could create the ND sets. So as I've mentioned, then the client cannot create the ND sets, but that functionality is interfaced within uh, Python API. And we have get asset, right? For if we know asset ID, but we also have get then set, right? And which gets a parameter, then the set ID. So that would be our function to use to return specific dandy set, not loop through all dandy sets in the archive. So our code then could be adjusted from the previous example, and we'll just get one dandy set client get dandy set, and we'll tell it that it's zero six. And we will not, we'll just print that dandy set as we did before. Let's see if this code works. It works, right? So we have 006 of draft version. Now, if we look back into that example on the top, we can see that there is already a command how to download and how to go through all the assets in the dandy set. So we could copy paste that part of the loop. And that will give us the loop, how to go through all the assets in the assets of this dandy set. And if we were to download them, there we go. We just copy paste this line and that might just do it. And it didn't work it, latest we don't have, we have just dandy set. Path. Oh, Jesus Christ, okay. We need to copy paste more. Oh, before downloading it, we need to create that directory. Oh, Jesus Christ. Let's do that. Or maybe. Doesn't create directory. I will cheat for now. I'll just create this directory and we'll continue with the example. There we go. Now it did download, but then, and I failed with my example. Who can spot an error? What should they fix? Multiple subjects. Multiple subjects. I created only for one, huh? Okay, then we'll do it properly. So this will be our asset path. Asset path. Asset path. And then there will be, I am running it, it will fail, but there is also a directory, right? That path has, what is it, base, I believe, right? I already forgot how it looks like. There, uh, there was some comment, I think. Base here? It should be parent. Oh, parent. Here we go. Parent. And then why it doesn't complete? Make dear. Here we go. Completion work. So we'll create that directory for that asset and we'll download it under that path. And now it just complains that it exists. And uh, because here there should be, maybe we'll do this. That's fine. You can say X is okay equal to true. Oh, it is there. I forgot already which library has it. What exists? Okay. There we go. Finally. So we'll create a directory. Most probably download should do that for us. And then we'll just look, what did we download? And we could open terminal actually. So under here, where did I download? D. 
daily notebooks that's where i was daily notebooks not data here we go and we have our dainty set six which i downloaded assets manually in my code instead of using the client or so these are all were downloaded recently okay we succeeded with this exercise yay okay next component which is uh getting a little bit more technical but on the other hand it's actually really convenient after you learn that it exists so every interaction which client did here which then the client command did or even web ui <laughs> like this website how it, they interact with the archive it's all done through dendy api server so the NDA API server is also open source. It's all available on GitHub, implemented in Django. And it is the server which is the archive. And what I mean by that, that it takes care about um, managing all the dandy sets, all the assets, uploading the data to Amazon. So all the user management and all of that done by that server and its interface is made publicly available to you so you could interact with it through all those various components which we already demonstrated or directly so notebook includes this uh, url to swagger interface of the uh, archive and you have api in the archive.org slash swagger but there is also if you want to play with your own dandy sets on staging you could use api dash staging in the archive.org swagger and what this swagger interface is it shows you which so-called endpoints uh, which is pretty much functions right which are part of the url uh, which are exposed as url on the on this api server and which are available to you let's say in our case we the first exercise would be really simple is to list dandy sets known to the archive. We just did that exercise in Python API, right? So we got our uh, interface, right? Dendy API client. And that's why it's called Dendy API client because it talks to the API server. And we listed all the dandy sets. Now we can do it directly by talking to the API server through this Swagger interface. And you can see there is this get dandy sets endpoint. And how Swagger interface works, if you click on this line, it expands it into which options it takes and also which responses it could provide. And if we want to try it out and note that I am now on API staging, I'll just maybe go back for consistency because before we were playing with the main archive. I went to API in the archive.org and there is this endpoint, the indices and i click on that line it expands it and we can try it out you can see on the right try it out and what happens then it gives you ability to enter any of those optional in this case arguments which we don't care to enter and we execute and by execute it runs the command and provides the output right here see so it outputs oh there is 120 dandy sets and this is all of those results. But what is more interesting that it gives you a command to run in the terminal. Actually, this token is of no relevance because it's all uh, public access uh, for this particular command. So what is important is that this, I called it endpoint, right? So slash dandy sets. And why is it endpoint? Because it becomes the last part of your URL how you talk to the API server. So it's API in the archive.org slash API. And then that at point that creates a URL which you could talk to. And it gives you curl command, which is just simple downloader, which you could run in the common line. So for completeness, we could run the same command without Python API, just in the terminal to get a list of all the dandy sets. In this case, it's not nicely formatted, just big long json but the point is that through the ND api you have access to all the functionality which we expose also in the let's say dandy api client 
or then the command line interface. So if you're working in some exotic language, you could just talk directly to the API server. And in the next exercise was we already got done first, right? We've got all the dandy sets. And there is another uh, useful endpoint is that um, you could, let's say, list all the assets, right? How it was also in dandy API, we listed all the assets for a dandy set. Let's say we could go for this dandy set versions assets list endpoint. And this one becomes a little bit more complicated, right? Because we want to enter for which specific dandy set and for which version we want some assets. So let's try it out. We hit try it out. And then we need to mention which dandy set. Let's say it would be that simple one, or we have to six open, right? We could go to six and it has only 53 assets. So it's all nice. And we can enter now, let's say not this, but six and version draft and execute. And again, it will provide us curl command. You could see that the end point changed, right? It became longer with all these dandy set versions, but also all the results. And you could copy paste this command in the terminal or use it elsewhere again to interface to the archive. Okay. And the last topic for this part would be, uh, I'll give you a really brief presentation of what data lab is about. And if you like Git, uh, I hope that many of you use Git already on a daily basis to version control your code. Data lab project allows you to version control your code, your data, your computing environments. And we have lots of documentation about data lab in particular I would recommend you to check out our JOS paper, which was published recently for a really condensed presentation of what DataLab is about, but also DataLab handbook, which is really extensive documentation about DataLab. But in a nutshell, uh, DataLab is a helper on top of Git and Git Annex to version control your data and all daily data sets are periodically updated and then uploaded to GitHub, but without data, just Git repositories, which are quite lightweight. They're uploaded to GitHub and are available under this strict version control mechanism. And why is it useful? It's useful even just to get access to the data. Let's say in this example, we can look at the data set, which is altogether, what is it, over 11 terabytes. Right, And if we go to our terminal, we print it out and we call data let install. Oh, actually I've pasted it too much. There we go. So what happens then, instead of fetching all those 17 terabytes or 11 terabytes as would have happened with a uh, dandy download, uh, this dandy set URL, we're just cloning the repository which has only symbolic links pointing to specific for every data file. And then we could use those few extra commands, which are outlined in this um, tutorial, get and drop to get particular file we want to analyze, let's say, or just check out or drop it. Or it could be the entire directory on which you want to uh, get files off. And maybe that wasn't the easiest one to even clone, <laughs> although that dandy set shouldn't be too big. I hope that it will come to its senses really soon. Come on. Typically, this operation takes no time. Come on. Live demos are most tricky. Okay, I'll demonstrate also meanwhile on 27. 27 should be our tiny, tiny one. It doesn't have gigabytes of data though. Yeah, that, that's good. So if we go, let's say to 27, we can see that we have this file, which is a symbolic link. And if we try to open it, it doesn't open it. It says there is no such file. 
but we can request, give me this file and datalet will go and download it from wherever that file is available from. And now that file could be, let's say we could again, use this DLS command just to see basic metadata from this file. And whenever we are done with it, we can drop the content of that file. So it will be removed from local storage. So if we download it two gigabytes, then we drop them, but we still have that particular file visible on the file system. So we could at any point in time, again, request to get it back. And I don't know what's happening with this 26. Apparently it was too big to swallow. Okay. And I think at this point, I'll just stop presenting and we'll be ready to answer your questions. Let me open chat. I think right now people can ask any questions. So uh, okay. since we have only like a few minutes left, feel free to ask any question about the Dendi. And also I paste once again, the link to the server. So if you haven't filled it, please fill it. So it will be like easier for us to implement things that you want. So I'll ask some of the, I'll answer at least one of the questions that was on there. Uh, do people tend to upload data directly as they do experiments or generally only put complete sets ready to publish? So Dandy supports both of those modes. And that's actually one of the things that we want to encourage in the community. You can do either, whatever suits you. Uh, as open science uh, people, we would recommend kind of putting it, using it almost like you would use GitHub which is to put code as you're kind of working on it. But you can also upload things at the end of the day. Uh, one of those examples that I showed very early on was a data set that's generated by multiple sites. And because they're collaborating on it, it actually makes sense for them to upload as data are produced and then collaborate with each other. And then once they curate data, they can finalize it and publish it. I hope that answers your question. Moreover, in the utopian future, all data will be downloaded straight from the hardware. It should all come out in a standard form. You shouldn't mess with uh, conversions and there will be, and that's what, uh, let's say, collaboration with OpenFIS projects tries to achieve. That OpenFIS produce immediately, produces immediately usable and WB files. So, There are no further questions. I want to thank all the people who've stuck around uh, with us. Uh, the recording will be edited and made available alongside all the materials which are already available. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. And also uh, please tell your colleagues and collaborators about the archive and that we welcome any kind of data submission. Ah, so there's another question. What controls are in place for people taking your data and publishing it without acknowledging you? Uh, we don't have any specific controls in place. Uh, I mean, this would be akin to somebody taking a GitHub software repo and publishing it as if it was their own. Uh, so I think 
we don't have any direct notions of this. However, uh, if somebody takes data and reuses it in another dandy set, which we welcome, uh, we, because they're using the same bytes, there will be a pointer to the original dandy set it came from when they do so. So in that sense, there will be links in the archive. Uh, but in terms of the social notion of how enforcing might be done, we don't do that enforcement. I mean, it would be very similar to other software or publications or other things in that sense. So the, there was a question about the use of Python. Uh, at present, all interactions with the archive are through the CLI. So I won't necessarily say Python, but you would need to know how to use the terminal and use the Python client. Uh, so at least at a basic level to be able to install the client and to use it from the command line. You don't need to use Python to interact with the archive. However, if you're doing applications or want to process the data and not just download it, then some of the things that uh, Ben and Yarek showed would require uh, using a Python the Dandy Python library to operate. Yeah, I'll just add that. I, I did an example, um, NWB write in Python. You can do that in MATLAB as well though you can't right now do that in MATLAB on Dandy Hub, you'd have to use your own computer to do that. As for protections or further acknowledging, indeed we have timestamps for operations also. They, they data-led data says they have commit timestamps which correspond to the dates when things changed in Dandy. But anyway, um, we cannot really force anybody to cite. It just seems to be a proper, you know, hygiene to um, let's say acknowledge that data was obtained from this archive if they don't want to claim that it's theirs or came from other sources. And Ben probably would be able to answer the question about next workshop, NWB user workshop, which would be concentrating also on uh, NWB conversion. Yes, and for those who are here, I would also say, uh, if you send us a message on the kinds of things that you would like, uh, workshops, tutorials, or other things around, uh, please let us know and uh, we are trying to make all of our materials available openly um, on our handbook. And that's where we would like to kind of just keep increasing the materials that could help you. Uh, so if, if you find something that wasn't useful, let us know. If you want something that would be uh, good for us to kind of provide, let us know as well. Okay, and with that, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for sticking around and look forward to seeing you at a future workshop. Bye, folks. <laughs>